you have your Bibles with you, we ask you to turn to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 23, and we'll begin in reading in verse 6, Acts 23, uh, beginning in verse 6. The Bible says, But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am, in quest I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude were divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither there neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove, saying, we, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel hath spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the pleasure of being in your house this morning and for sitting in for a little while with your people. We praise you for the word that lies before us, for how it speaks to us and teaches us your character and your goodness and your saving ability, Lord. We praise you for that. God, help us to preach the word as it lies before us, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching this morning uh, on the thought, when he comes to me. Now, Paul had an unusual situation, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, where he was an apostle. Now, to me, all the criterion of an apostle is given in Acts chapter 1. You had to see the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. And that's why today, people that call them of the apostolic faith, they are not because no one since Paul has ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. And, and so their, their whole doctrine is in error because they claim to be an apostle and are not, is what Paul said. And, and, and so we find then that uh, Paul's comfort was seeing Christ. Paul's, uh, Paul's blessing was being able to uh, look at the visage of Christ and great, get great uh, great encouragement from that. Now, we live in the modern day. No one sees Christ these days. So where do our comfort come from but the Holy Ghost? That's the only, that's the only active part of God in this world is the Holy Spirit and His, and His definite Word of God. That plus nothing. Now, we, uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, we need to be a people that looks for the leading and the encouragement and the joy of the Holy Ghost. That is a gone truth in Baptist churches. Now, all they want, all they focus on is uh, really their five sharpened points, but what we should be focused on is living with uh, the, living with the person of the Holy Ghost within the realms of the book that lies before me. Back in verse 6, uh, 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 back in verse 6, the Bible says, But when Paul perceived, 
Now, if you know your word of God, he had been in a mess because he was preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, and they were about ready to stone him. All the Jews were there before him, and they were saying, this man, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, cannot be the Christ, and given all their reasons why it couldn't be, and the more that they said that, the more Paul uh, <laughs> proved that he, yes, in fact, was the Christ. And it made them so mad they didn't know what to do. And so they were about ready to take him out. Now the Lord and Paul understood all of a sudden there was a divided group. There were people that believed one thing and people that believed another thing. He, he, he got the understanding. But when Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in council, man, and brethren, I am a Pharisee. Now, when we often do the Bible, we, uh, we think of Pharisees as self-righteous people. Sometimes I've even said it, and, and in that context, I see myself as a Pharisee, that I've arrived, that I know everything, that I, I, I've always preached the truth. And, and that's a Pharisaical attitude, but the real distinction of a Pharisee in the Jewish culture he gives, and that's that they believe in the resurrection of the dead, and uh, they believe in angels. And when he sensed that division, he really used it to his advantage. Because he knew that the Pharisees that there were there would come to his rescue, to his part, because he did believe in angels and he believed a life beyond this life. Now, that's a question I would ask myself this morning because, see, uh, the supposed atheists don't believe in a life after this one. They believe it's nothing. Now, I've always wondered, and I want to ask an atheist this, if he doesn't exist, why are you so hung up on proving that he doesn't? Right. You know, if I believe that the color I had on was, was orange, and we know it's blue, and I said, no, that's orange, why would I make a fight out of it? And, and so if they're saying God does not exist, what, well, what it really is this is uh, they don't want us to acknowledge him either. It, it's not so bad. It's not so much about them not believing in Christ. They're mad because we do. That, that's the real the sum of the whole matter. And, and so we find that uh, Paul perceived that these were pharisaical people that believed in the resurrection of the dead. But Paul perceived that the one part was Sadducees and the other Pharisees, and he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called into question. I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension or a division, an argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. Now, could you imagine such a hopeless life believing nothing beyond this? I can imagine. Can you believe, can you, can you perceive a situation when you draw your last breath, nothing? Uh, I, can't, I can't perceive that. And you know, it's not because I'm so good. It's because the, the Holy Ghost has assured me there's more, there's more after this than there is here. Yeah. And, and, and so understanding that and knowing that at least the Pharisees and all their self-righteousness and all that they did, they knew of a land that was ahead. Now, I ask you this morning, are you assured of that, that there's something better waiting on the other side? And then the other distinctive that they had was angels. You know what? There are angels all around us all the time, both on Lucifer's side and both on the Almighty's side, all the time around us. And, and, and if we opened our eyes and 
scare us to death. Amen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Pharisees believed that. that they, they were entrenched in that. They understood that. And so uh, a good question for yourself, is, is that something that you, you <coughs> excuse me, embrace? Because to me, it's just a, it, it, it is just beyond my feeble mind to think about how the angels exist and what they do around us. And when they materialize. You know, a lot of Baptists don't even believe that angels materialize. But the Bible says you have entertained angels unaware. Right. That, mean, that means they take on this form. Right. And, and <laughs> who knows what we, what we pushed aside is nothing. Verse 9. And there was a great call, uh, a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let's not fight against God. And so what he was saying, if I remember his sermon correctly, he was talking about the Holy Spirit had showed him uh, that this was indeed Christ. And they said, wait a minute. The Pharisee says, well, if the Spirit said this, I want to hear more about it. Mm -hmm. And the Sadducees was ready to cut him in half. And so the, the crowd uh, was very divided. You know what I found among Baptist people is that the crowd is very divided on the person of the Holy Spirit. And uh, be careful about that because if I understand the word of God, he's our vehicle while we're living here. He's the one that speaks to us. He's the one that makes this word real. And so we need to respect that. Verse 10. And there arose a great dissension. The chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Now, a lot of people get upset and say, well, he was arrested. He didn't have nobody, blah, 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 blah. And I've even said that at times. But you know what it was? It was a deliverance of the Almighty. Can you imagine being taken from a place where they were about ready to stone you up to the castle where nobody could get you and you had the safety of the Almighty all around you? See, that's what he does for his people. Yeah. Took him from... The, the, the most risky part of his life up to a, a safe, solid place to worship the Almighty. Amen. See, that, that, that is what our God is capable of. That's what he does. That's what he, uh, he uh, delights in doing. And the night following, meaning the night, not, the, not that night that this all occurred, but the following night, and the night following, the Lord stood by him. Oh, what a wonderful thing. Can you imagine? Uh, and, and we read several parts of that after the resurrection, how he came and stood among him, and, and among them. You know, one place it says that, that the doors were locked, and he passed through and said, Peace be unto you. Mm -hmm. See, you can't lock the door on him, can you? Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people believe that. I, I certainly don't. If you can lock the door on him, he's not sovereign, is he? Right. He, he, he's something that's depending on you. And, and, and so, you know, he was standing there, and, and he didn't know if he was going to live or die. Can you imagine this? And, and Jesus came up and stood beside him. Oh, you I mean that? That makes you want to be an apostle, don't it? <laughs> That, that makes you want to be someone that would comprehend the person of Christ in this flesh. But uh, we know that that's an impossibility in the day that we live. But what an what a unbelievable thing that would, would happen. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, I want you to see two things. First of all, uh, he asked Paul something that's very hard, and, and most people miss this. Be a good cheer. Mm -hmm. See, they about ready to cut his head off, and one day they would. Yeah. They did exactly that. But you be happy with this, Paul. You know, uh, the Lord asks us to be happy 
in very, very difficult situations, when it seems like you're down to nothing, he asks you to be happy. When, when it seems like the church is drying up before your eyes, he asks you to be happy. Be of good cheer, Paul. I know your neck's on the block, and I know it don't look too good for you right now, but listen, your ministry is not over yet. You're going to go to Rome, and you know what? He didn't tell him this, but, but I think Paul knew it. You're going to go to Rome. You're going to preach the gospel there. There's going to be some good things to happen, and then they're going to cut your head off. See, it wasn't going to be Jerusalem's uh, self-righteous Jew to cut his head off. It was going to be the Romans. And uh, see, he had a plan for Paul's life, did he not? And, and, and so we find then that we as the Lord's people, uh, we uh, take great, great encouragement uh, when the Lord comes, stands by us in, in, in great and, and very sometimes difficult situations. Now, uh, go with me to 2 Timothy. Paul, uh, about saying goodbye to young Timothy. Timothy was pastoring the church in Ephesus. He had been, uh, he'd been criticized for his youth. He'd been, been criticized for his inexperience in the things of the Lord. And now Paul says, I have one more for you. I'm leaving here. I, 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 I'm done. Acts, I mean, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter number 4, verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verse 14. The Bible says this. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware also, for he is he had greatly withstood our words. Now what I understand about this uh, Alexander the coppersmith, at one time he had been on board with Paul, and then he began to change his thinking, and he opposed Paul. You know what? In the last five years, I have seen more so-called Baptist preacher or brand changing their thinking, and I want you to see the result in Paul's life. He says, they've done me much evil. It, it's been a lot, it's been difficult. You know what? When when there's one individual saying God is sovereign and doeth all things well, and not even a drop of water hits my face that God didn't sin, and somebody else is saying, No, you gotta do this, no, he's trying to help you, he's trying to save you. You know what that is? It's much harder. Because one or the other's got to be true. That's right. You know, um, there's never been two truths about anything. It's either one way or the other. And listen, uh, Baptist, uh, what we believe is Baptist is about gone. You know what? In the 70s, there was no question whatsoever about how we should present ourselves. I'll talk about that group down there at uh, Tennessee Ridge. You know, uh, you read the book of Acts when they had that book burning because it, op it, it opposed uh, the truth of God. When I was a boy uh, down there, uh, there was a great number of young, I mean young people in their teens in the 70s coming up and old ungodly rock music records are just throwing them on the pile. You know what? That's a good thing. Think about it. Would you see that today? Now in the modern, you know, a few years ago we had CDs. Now, now if you talk about up, up, uprooting the church and maybe me with you, uh, what we download today, we'd have to burn these dudes up, wouldn't we? You ain't gonna find many people to do that or push the delete button one, right? And, and, and so we see then, uh, <laughs> we can do evil to God's people if we're not very, very careful. Verse 6. At my first answer, no man stood with me. Now, I've been there, done that. 
right? You know what? Uh, if you preach the truth and stand for the truth, there are going to be days you're going to be there by yourself. Paul had it, didn't he? He, he? Nobody would stand with him. How many people do you think in the modern day is going to stand with you against Sodom? Men running with men and women running with women and our government putting approval on it and, 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 and calling people like me delivering hate speech. That's how Paul felt. Now it's easy to say and I got a, a good room of believers right here but yeah. you know what when you're out there and, and, and you're on the street and you're preaching the gospel from the street bunch that bunch go by and start throwing rocks see that's a little bit different ain't it? I, I saw I, I saw on my phone, I guess it was this morning, maybe it was last night, that uh, they stole rocks of people. Does that sound familiar? What about them stealing? See, it's coming on that direction again. But the question is this, do you even stand enough principle to be identified out of the world? And, and so we find then it's the Lord's people that certainly it should be our desire and our hope that, that we would be here. Uh, at the first answer, no man stood with me, but they all forsook me. I pray God, uh, I pray God that, it, that it may not be laid to their charge, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me. See, that's a lot better than having a bunch of men stay with him and go, oh yeah, there you go, preach it, preach it. You know what? It's a lot better to have the Lord have you back. You know what? Have the Lord withstand, holding you up when nobody else will, supporting you in the truth that is in that book when not one other person standing with you. I'd rather have the Lord. Yeah. He's a lot stronger than man, is he not? Yeah. He, he can do more for me than than anybody else can, so I'd rather have the Lord. And that was Paul's situation, and it was all because he was standing for truth. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. Now, how, you want a way to improve your preaching? Stand for everything that that book teaches, and I will guarantee you <laughs> now, it may not be well liked, and you may not have friends, and you may not have warm fuzzies, but you, do you desire the Lord standing with you, or do you desire warm fuzzies? Because that is a decision to be made in the modern world, is it not? And, and we, as the Lord's people, if we're generally say, certainly I'd rather have the presence of the Almighty than have this building rolling out, uh, rolling out and, and, and be full. You know, I've heard Brother Jr. Uh, uh, say this, and those of you that were with us at Bump of Smells, that building, I, I would say, was probably a little bigger than this one, uh, at least width-wise. And uh, I've heard Brother Junior tell of meetings where people were looking in the windows because there wasn't enough places to be set anymore. You know what? As neat as that sounds, I'd rather have what I have than a bunch of other people uh, <laughs> looking for entertainment. Looking because I ain't preaching what the Word of God teaches. I'll let that go. And, and, and so as we as the Lord's people, certainly we need to be in a situation this morning that the Lord stands with us. We don't get in that situation by living like the world. We don't get in a situation where the Lord stands by us by routine service. We don't get in a situation where the Lord stands by us by living in the world. We just don't. You want to know why you're discouraged? Maybe you should look at your life. Yeah. Right? Maybe, maybe today is the day to take inventory. Amen. Uh, we, uh, uh, do you crave that or do you not? See, I know I believe saved people. 
that don't crave it. Or they don't crave it enough to do what it takes to get it. I want the Lord standing by me. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's my greatest desire. And if, uh, if, it, if it means losing some friends over it, so be it. Because I desire this more than anything else. That's what I want. All right. Go with me to the, books, the book of Acts, chapter 9. Uh, Paul had recently been saved there on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9 and verse 27. And he had gone uh, back to Jerusalem. If you remember, he, he went to the believers there to, at Damascus. He was baptized, and now he's going back to Jerusalem. And Bar but Barnabas took him, meaning Paul, and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them, he had seen the Lord in the way. Now, here is the, here's the clink of all the matter. Now, again, what made him apostolic was this, that he saw the Lord visually in the way. Now, today, in the modern day, it's this. Either you know the Holy Spirit, either you know the Holy Ghost, or you lost. It, it can't be both ways. Because he is the functioning of God during the church age. And we're still in the church age. We're still, uh, we're still plodding along with the Great Commission. And right now, he is our active agent. Agent, so if you don't know him like that, you know what? You just don't know him. That's only that's the only conclusion I can come to is that you just don't know him. You know, uh, I praise God for the day the Lord saved me, but I do know this now, and I understand it. The older I get, I understand it better. If the Holy Ghost wasn't doing His work, I would have never seen it. I would have never known it. Because it's not logic. It's a spiritual divine event when the Lord saved you, saves you. But Barnabas took him and brought him unto the apostles and declared unto him how he had seen the Lord in the way. And how he, meaning the Lord, had spoken to him, meaning Paul, and how he, meaning Paul, preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to see that that the, uh, the idea that Barnabas had was this. I'll tell them how good Lord, the Lord's been, and I'll tell them how the Lord has used him, and maybe them up there at Jerusalem will believe me. Ever thought about your testimony and how convincing it is? See, to me, that's what Barnabas was trying to do, is it not you? I mean, it seems like a pretty simple writ to me. Is there enough to convince anybody? Kind of like that song they were singing. What's, what's your testimony going to be when this, this little life, you know, if you live 80, 100 years, what, what's going to be left? What's going to be your situation? Uh, you know, uh, I could care less. And the, the older I get, the less I care about homes and houses and lands. What I want is my testimony to be something that my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren can cling to. That old granddaddy was something else. That's what I want. I, I, I don't want to be remembered as a compromiser. And, and, and so we find then, uh, as the Lord's people, what he used to convince the believers back at Jerusalem is what he did. Not what he said, not, not a sinner's prayer, none of that uh, uh, foolishness, but that he had seen Christ in the way and it made a result in his life. You know, uh, that, that's what we need to look for. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the first verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in the first verse, Paul writes, Am I not an apostle? Certainly he was. Am I not an apostle? I mean, am I not an, uh, 
Apostle, am I not free? Are you free? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you free from sin? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? And certainly he has. Are, you, are not ye my work in the Lord? Now, my question is this. Do you know the Lord via the person of the Holy Ghost? Because if you know him, that's the only way it came to be. Because, see, he's the one that unlocks those spiritual eyes and, and opens up spiritual ears and makes you to hear the gospel in a brand new way. He's the one that takes that Bible in your lap and, and as, uh, as it says in uh, John, uh, John's Gospel, first chapter, make it a living word. You know, you know why that's a distinctive? What does living things do? They move. They make noise. See, so, uh, it speaks to you, does it not? That's a living word. And you know what? If we don't see the word of God in, in that way, listen, you better make your call in the election sure because you may not have what you think you have. What we need, <laughs> what we need to know and be convinced of the Holy Ghost is this. One very simple thing. Have you been saved? You, you know what I have found? Other precious truths kind of fall into place if you're really saved. That, that, that's what I have found. That, that's what I've seen down through the years. Uh, I've seen some people, pretty many people on Baptist Road, on Baptist Roads, Come to find out they didn't have what they thought they did. I always speak of Sue Downs. I love her dearly. I love her before she was saved. I mean, if you talk about somebody, you didn't have to wonder about what they think. Uh, I mean, she would belt her out before the thought was complete. The Bible has a whole lot to say about that, too. But, you know what? Sue's problem was this she didn't know the Lord, she knew about Him. And you hear on testimony, I think that's the name of the church. It's, it's not Faith Baptist Church at Paducah, but the other one, that, they had that big, gigantic building. Lord saved her there. Or he thought he, she, she had been saved. But some well-meaning people, I'm sure, a lot of people didn't know about this, but Sue's mother left her. She was raised by two old maid aunts. And... Uh, her mother had reappeared. He was talking about taking Sue out west with her. And she was scared to death. And she got emotional about being, being taken away from her aunts. And she was crying and carrying on. And the people around them took it to be Holy Ghost conviction, but it just wasn't. And then 60 years later, yeah. the Lord shows up in the Paducah ICU and manifest himself to her. See, that's the difference. And she literally was a different lady like that after that. Now, she still had the same, uh, but you know what? Uh, and, and I never thought I'd say this. Sue was a very pleasant lady to be around after that. And makes all the difference, doesn't it? Uh, I want the real deal, don't you? I want, I, I want to be certain when I leave this place Y'all plant me over there that you don't have to worry about Larry. You see what I'm saying? That there's no question whatsoever that I know the Lord. And th this is the thing. If you know him, you love him. You ever know about that? I, I hope you see that that's true. If you know Christ, you love Christ. Now, uh, all the people in here and... Uh, your children is a different love. I'll say that first of all. all right. uh, it, it's a different kind of love. And uh, Sarah got home yesterday. I had to kiss her on the cheek because she'd been gone a week. And uh, glad to see her. And, but when it comes down to this, the only person in this room that could ask me to do something difficult and I would try 
is done. If she needed it, or if she wanted it, and I thought I was able, I would get to it. That's the kind of love that you have for Christ. And so if he asked us of something, though it may be difficult on the flesh, you'd strive to do it. That saves people, is it not? If he asked you to preach the gospel in a foreign land, you say, hey, I don't know the language, no habla inglés, but hey, I'm heading out. Right? That's the difference. See, saved people love the Lord, and lost people go through motions. Do they not? Uh, I'm very fearful in this last day, all these crazy things they call worship. It, it's nothing more than getting the, the flesh charged up a little bit, you know? And then when you stand in eternity, what are you going to say? What's going to be your response? Bible is very clear on it. Someone will say, "Did I not? Did I not testify in thy name?" And he'll say unto them, "Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you." Right. Pretty sober stuff, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I want to know him better today than I did yesterday, mm-hmm. and and tomorrow I want to know him better yet still. You know how it is. I mean, I've been married over 32 years now. And uh, I've gone to the point where I about say, Donna, don't say it. Because I know what she's thinking. You see, you see what I'm saying? And uh, that's the same way with Christ. You, you know him intimately. You, you know his character. You know his goodness. You know his provision. And the way you do that the way you learn those things is not cognitive. It's through the person of the Holy Ghost. He'll teach you. The Holy Ghost will teach you everything you want to know about Christ. And that way when we get there, we don't hear, hear that, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. We'll hear, it, we'll hear, enter in, thou good and faithful servant, and to the joys, plural, of the Lord. Do you really know him? Have you been saved? Has the Holy Ghost did a wonderful work in your life, uh, made your calling and your election sure?